Hello again, Andre here from the MZAG team. This video in our interview series covers a hot topic for interviews, pro-life versus pro-choice, the debate on abortion. We'll cover the relevance to medicine, points from both sides, as well as legal points of interest. Timestamps in the description below. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome to our debate video on abortion. Over the next 15 minutes, we will debate the pros and cons of abortion to help you prepare for your medical school interviews. I will be chairing the debate. Hannah will be arguing for abortion, also known as the pro-choice argument, and Una will be arguing against abortion, sometimes called pro-life. By the end of this video, you should be able to define what abortion means, discuss the pros and cons of abortion in relation to the four pillars of medical ethics, and have a brief understanding of the laws surrounding abortion in the UK and abroad as well as being able to give real life examples of cases. I would like to start by defining what abortion means. An abortion is the medical process of ending a pregnancy so it doesn't result in the birth of a baby. It's also sometimes known as termination. Let's get stuck in then. Hannah, why are you voting for abortion today? One in three women in the UK will have an abortion in their lifetime, so it isn't rare. I will talk you through each pillar of medical ethics, but we'll start with what I think is the most important, autonomy. A woman should have the right to decide what happens to her own body. Imagine if you woke up one morning and someone had plugged you into a machine that for the next nine months was going to live off you, put you at risk of serious medical conditions, disrupt your education and relationships and cause you pain. At the end of nine months, detaching from the machine will be even more dangerous with risk of bleeding, infections and even death. It was estimated in 2015 that 303,000 women would die from complications relating to pregnancy and childbirth that year. And this isn't a problem relating to just developing nations. In the US, almost 24 mothers still die for every 100,000 live babies born. Most people would agree that every human being has a right to their own body. The fetus exists within the mother's body and she should therefore have the right to decide what happens to it and to avoid these risks if that's what she wants to do. Let's move on to the cons argument with Una. Thank you, Chair. I agree that autonomy is important. So what about the autonomy of the fetus? Why should someone else be able to decide that they can't have a chance at life? I know there are different views as to when a fetus becomes a person. Some people suggest that this comes later with the development of the ability to think, imagine and communicate. But I argue that the embryo from the moment of conception is genetically identical to the baby, child and then the adult that they would become. Surely it is therefore a human being with rights. I agree that every human being has absolute right over his or her body. So under the exact same argument as Hannah proposed, we do not have the right to effectively kill this human being without giving them a choice in the matter. Good arguments from both sides there on autonomy. I have an interesting legal case in relation to the rights of the mother. The case of Roe versus Wade in 1973. This was a US Supreme Court judgment following which abortions were made illegal for all in the first three months of the pregnancy. In 1969, a 25-year-old lady under the pseudonym Jane Roe filed a case challenging the criminal abortion laws in Texas. At the time, this law did not allow abortion unless the life of the mother was in danger. Even though Roe had said she'd been raped, her case was rejected and she was forced to give birth. Four years later, in 1973, the case made it to the US Supreme Court. They ruled that the laws in Texas did infringe a woman's right to privacy. This started a trimester system in the US and gave women the absolute right to abortion in the first three months of pregnancy. The laws in the US continue to change, however. States can now impose some restriction on abortions, even those in the first three months. It was around the same time, just a few years earlier in 1967, that the Abortion Act was passed in the UK, allowing legal abortion on some grounds as well as free provision through the NHS. This was a really important case. Interestingly though, the patient involved, whose real name is Norma McCarvey, later came out to say the rape allegation was false and that she is now a pro-life supporter who protests against abortion. Most every American alive today has heard of Roe vs Wade and knows what that means. But few people know that I was Jane Roe in the case 35 years ago that legalised abortion on demand. 
Hello, I'm Norma McCorvey. Today, as a born-again Christian and a faithful Catholic, I'm working to reverse Roe, and I'm urgently asking for your help right now. On November 4th, we will have the last chance in a generation to end Roe. One vote, your vote, could determine who the next Supreme Court Justice will be. Her attorney, however, argues that the rape allegation was not important in the case, and the ruling still stands, whether the claimant has now swapped sides or not. So, what about the next ethical pillars, beneficence and non-maleficence, and justice? Non-maleficence is really important here. First, do no harm is the maxim we all work by as doctors. By performing an abortion, we end a life which must be considered the ultimate harm. Therefore, in terms of non-maleficence, it is clear that abortion is wrong. Saying abortion is wrong is an overstatement. Consider this, a fetus with a genetic illness that we know is going to be born with a life-limiting condition. We know they will be born and then they will suffer for days, months or even years before they die. Do you really agree that we do less harm by prolonging life and allowing their suffering? Sometimes it could be in the best interest of the fetus to prevent suffering from the start. For the mother as well, I've already said how dangerous pregnancy and childbirth is, but what about her mental health? Having to carry, deliver, and then choose to either raise or give up an unwanted child could seriously damage her mental health, especially if the pregnancy was a product of rape, as initially claimed in the Roe versus Wade case. Also important to consider are any other children that the, this mother has. If she is already struggling to care for three children at home, a new baby would place increased stress on the family and might not be in their best interests. The concept that a new baby would be detrimental to the physical or mental health of any existing children is actually a reason a doctor is allowed to perform an abortion up to 24 weeks in the UK. It is a little simplistic to say that giving birth can cause multiple harms to the mother and thus that she should be allowed to have an abortion. Abortion itself carries its own risks and possible harms for the mother. There are two ways of carrying out abortion, either by taking out tablets to induce a miscarriage or by surgical removal of the pregnancy. Both involve risks and potential harm to the mother. Sometimes they can even permanently damage reproductive organs. This is an avoidable harm. As well as potential physical harm, there is a risk to mental health with abortion. Hannah said that carrying an unwanted child can affect the mental health of the mother, which is true, but so can having an abortion. The Royal College of Psychiatrists published a report in 2008 saying that although the current evidence is inconclusive, some studies have identified a range of mental disorders following abortion. How would you feel if you had an abortion and then later regretted your choice? Again, I can see there are arguments from both sides of the debate in regards to beneficence and non-maleficence. Hannah, you mentioned that sometimes abortion might be the most non-maleficent option to prevent suffering in a fetus with a life-limiting condition. Let's look briefly at what the UK law says in relation to this. In the UK, the Abortion Act of 1976 permits abortion at any time during pregnancy if there is a substantial risk that the fetus would be seriously handicapped. It is also allowed at any time, if necessary, to prevent grave injury to the physical or mental health of the mother. Otherwise, abortion is allowed up to 24 weeks if continuing the pregnancy would involve greater risk to the mental or physical health of the mother or any existing children than terminating the pregnancy would. We've just heard that, that being pregnant is dangerous. Therefore, this can almost always be justified. In the UK, two doctors are required to agree the criteria are met before a woman can proceed with an abortion. It is important to remember that laws on abortion differ significantly between countries, so I suggest that you check the laws in the region that you are applying to medical school before your interview, as this is a common ethics topic to be asked about. In nearby Northern Ireland, for example, abortion is illegal unless there is a serious or permanent risk to the mother's physical or mental health. It worries me when I hear that some areas still do not provide legal abortions. Have you seen in the news about the increasing number of women buying online abortion pills? In 2016, 375 illegal abortion pills that had been bought on the internet were seized by the police. Although it's illegal for a woman to have an abortion in the UK with medical approval, buying pills to do it yourself is illegal and dangerous. 
If barriers to legal abortions are increased, we'll be putting more women at risk as more would turn to dangerous, unregulated abortion pills. This brings me on to the justice, our final ethical pillar. Justice means we should treat all equals equally. What about gender equality between men and women? Men can't get pregnant and must never go through the process of pregnancy and childbirth. Therefore, the only way to achieve true gender equality is to allow women the same choice and freedom as men to not be pregnant. Justice also includes distributive justice. Each abortion costs the NHS on average £680. In 2010, the Department of Health reported spending 118 million of taxpayers' money on abortions. Consider that the NHS is already strapped for cash. I think that the money could be better spent elsewhere. In our busy A&E departments, for example, saving lives. Preventing pregnancies in the first place with education and contraception would be much cheaper and would reduce the needs for abortion. I'm sure we all agree that preventing unwanted pregnancies would be the ideal. But once someone is pregnant, if we are talking about money, consider how much more than £680 each of these pregnancies would cost. They need antenatal care, delivery, postnatal care, and perhaps even social care for the children afterwards if they don't stay with the mother. That's much more expensive than one abortion. Considering justice and treating equals as equals, do you think that the father should have a say in whether the pregnancy can be aborted? In the real case of Patton versus the British Pregnancy Advisory Service in 1978, a wife was pregnant with her husband's child and wanted to have an abortion. The procedure had been agreed by two medical doctors as required, but her husband didn't want it to happen. He applied to the court for an injunction restraining her from having an abortion without his consent. Does he have a case? The baby is genetically half his, therefore surely yes, he should have some autonomy over what happens. In terms of beneficence, if wanted, a child could have a positive effect on his life. And if we think of non-maleficence, being told that the baby will be aborted against his wishes could damage his mental health and his relationship with his wife or partner. Regarding justice though, I don't think that the husband has any legal rights over the pregnancy. I think the opposite here. It is the mother who will have to carry and deliver the baby, so she should be the one with the autonomy and have the right to make independent decisions about what happens to her own body. If the child is not wanted, remaining pregnant could affect her mental health and wanted or not, the pregnancy is also a risk to her physical health. In terms of justice, I agree the husband does not have any legal rights to say what happens to the pregnancy at this time. What happened in this case? The judge agreed with both of you about the law. The husband has no right to stop or prevent an abortion and did not have a case here. It is also really important to consider the opposite scenario when a woman presents requesting an abortion, whether she's been coerced by a partner, friends or family. In the US, coercion into abortion has been increasingly recognised as a problem with some states introducing anti-coercion legislation. Pro-life campaigners argue that limiting access to abortion will protect women by reducing coercion, which is a form of domestic violence. Una, you have been arguing the case against abortion today. If a doctor who is morally against abortion sees a patient who is requesting one, what do they do? The Abortion Act has a conscientious objection clause which permits doctors and nurses to refuse to participate in an abortion if it conflicts with their personal, religious or moral beliefs, unless it is necessary to prevent the death or grave permanent injury. The doctor should, however, refer the patient on to another doctor for a second opinion. Absolutely. If unsure, you should speak to a senior colleague or a defence union. This is always worth mentioning in any ethics questioner interview. That's unfortunately all we have time for on this abortion debate. We have covered the definition of abortion, heard from both sides of the debate on autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, justice relating to abortion, looked briefly at laws and how they differ, who has a say in whether a woman has an abortion and what to do as a doctor and if you have a moral objection. Remember, when asked for an opinion in an interview, you need to present both sides of the argument and then weigh up and pick a side, just as both of our volunteers have done to today. Best of luck in your interviews. Welcome back and thanks for watching. Do you have any opinions on this topic? Do you have any arguments for or against that we did not cover that you would like us to discuss? Let us know in the comments below. If you found this video helpful, please leave a like, and if you want to see more medical school admissions content, then subscribe to our channel. We put out new videos every week. Best of luck on your admissions.